an old man wandered into a country store and there he discovered in all the midst of the merchandise something he had never seen before something that was unique unusual to him he looked at it he picked it up it was a mirror he had never seen a mirror before but he looked into it and said oh my this looks like my uncle zeke it's a photograph of uncle zeke i'm buying it and i'm taking it home now unfortunately Uncle Zeke wasn't a family favorite, and the family had been feuding quite a bit with him. So he slipped that mirror underneath the mattress and thought, I won't bring it out until there's been some resolution. But curiosity got a hold of him, and he thought, I'll sneak it away and I'll put it in the barn. I'll go to the barn and I'll look at that beautiful picture. Look, it's Uncle Zeke. It's a photograph. It looks just like him. Look at that. And amazing. He'd slip it away. He'd go back to the barn every afternoon, every evening in wonder and amazement, seeing I'd never seen anything like that. And to look and see Uncle Zeke was quite something. Well, his wife got suspicious. What's he doing in the barn? What's he doing sneaking away? What's going on? So when he left, she wandered into the barn and discovered that unusual object called a mirror. She picked it up and looked at it and it said, Aha, now I know. This is the woman he's been seeing all the time. Life is a mirror. You look into it, it reflects back to you exactly what's in front of it. This is a spiritual truth that's found in today's text that you read so beautifully that says, and we all who with unveiled faces, meaning the faces that have been unveiled, completely revealed, taking all obstacles and all barriers away, unveiled faces, contemplate then the Lord's glory. And we are being transformed into his image with an ever-increasing glory which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Now, a text that you may say, I don't quite understand, but let me explain, and let's break it down so beautifully for us. For as we understand life being a mirror, we know that we experience only what we see, and what we see, we are. So when we look into that mirror of life, and we see things that we're not so crazy about, maybe we have to think and stop and reflect for a moment. What is it in me? What am I seeing that I don't like or I need to change or needs to be addressed? Because nothing will be found in this world which is not first found within ourselves. A very spiritual truth echoed throughout the ages in the scriptural texts as, the Emerson, as Emerson wrote to us that only which we have within will we see without. So it's only what you have recognized and acknowledged and what you see within will be projected in the mirror of life and be revealed for the world to see. There's an old saying that says, if we meet no gods, it's because we harbor none. It's because sometimes we haven't really awakened to the kingdom of God. We don't see the kingdom of God. And there's people who say, I don't see love. I don't see grace. I don't see mercy. I don't see compassion. I don't see these things because we haven't awakened to it. We question and wonder, where is God in all the experiences of what we're going through? Where is God in the midst of our trials and our tribulations? Where is God in the midst of chaos and, and uh, what we term as evil in our world? Where is God? God within. But we have to stop and acknowledge that divine presence within, first and foremost. It's so important that we do some soul searching and discover what is within you. What's deep within you and who you are and how you are divinely created and how beautiful this experience is. So it's time to go within and say, what's within me that I would like to see reflected in this mirror of life? What's deep within me? What do I find within me? And what things within me do I not want to see reflected in the world around me? You know, living in Africa, we learned something about elephants. One thing about elephants is that nothing makes an elephant quite so angry as seeing his own reflection in the pool. He gets angry because he doesn't know what it is. He looks in there, what is this? It's not very pretty. It's not very gorgeous. It's not very, there's the consciousness of this elephant in fear thinking, is this an adversary? Is this something coming against me? And so no matter how thirsty he may be, when he sees his image, he becomes angry, upset, and disturbed. The same thing sometimes happens to us. When we uh, look in the mirror of life and we see things that we don't see are so beautiful and so gorgeous. And we may be looking in the mirror of life and think, oh, I see it in you and you and you, but never acknowledge it in me, yes in me, yes in me. 
how easy it is to point out the things that we see in one another. And we may see, as the scripture says, we note that someone else has a beam in their eye. You may have referred that phrase or heard of that phrase from the scripture of the gospels, talking about how quickly we are to point out something else happening within someone else without recognizing what's going on within our own lives. And how important it is that we stop. Before we get all upset about what's going on in others, we say, why did we recognize something we didn't like in someone else unless we saw it within ourselves? And how important that is to acknowledge that sometimes we're jealous, we're envious, we're angry, we're upset with someone else, but we realize that, you know what? It's something going on within me that I need to address. This is then the person who is veiled. We're covered up in this idea and thinking that everything going on and wrong and around the world is, has to do with everybody else and that we're not involved or related to it at all. It's a veil that's over us. And so the scripture says, as in the passages in Corinthians, the Apostle Paul writes about looking into a mirror and seeing dimly, seeing in a way that we're just can't comprehend. We can't quite understand. We don't understand what's going on in the world around us and why all these things are happening about us because we are veiled and we're not seeing clearly. We're not seeing through this experience. So most of us have a handy little mirror. You may have one in your purse, a compact. You may have, yes, gentlemen, you may have one, uh, uh, but ladies too. Uh, and uh, you may have a rear view mirror that you adjust or that mirror pulls down and you may look into that mirror to say, what do you do? You, you check out to see, do I look okay? Is my hair right? Is my lipstick on? Is, you know, what is that, what I've got? You know, you know what's examining your own self and saying, what needs to be changed or what needs to be corrected within our life. And so it is within our spiritual journey that when we stop and look into the mirror of life, we may have to ask, what do I need to adjust? What do I need to change? What needs to be corrected here? And how do we correct these things in our spiritual life that are being projected and seen in the mirror of life, reflected back to us? How do we change that? It begins by living the unveiled life, lifting, lifting that veil, that veil of ignorance, that veil of misunderstanding, that veil that says we don't quite get the fact that what's going on within is what's seen without. That's what's being revealed all around us. So we lift this veil that obscures our vision, and we do it by awakening to the power of love. That's right. We first got to do is to awaken to the power of love. I want to invite you to do something that's a powerful experience in your day-to-day -day love. Just be in love. Just be in love. Step in love. Be in the love. Know that the love is all around you. And stop and pause for a moment in this great silence of just experiencing I am in love. I'm not in love with something. I am in the presence of love for God is love. And I'm in that. And when I'm there, I can rest beautifully. And there I know exactly what I need. Because you know what is a wonderful thing? You don't need to tell love what you need. When you experience love, you don't need to tell it what you need because love knows what you need because it is love. And it knows your highest and best. Knows everything. When you, so when you're in love and you're in God, who is love, when you're resting in that place, you don't need to say a thing. Beautiful silence. Resting. Being in love. is this powerful awakening that says, now I know, for I experience this love that nurtures me, cares for me, does everything that I may need and knows my need before I even ask, for that is the power of this divine presence called love. So when we understand this from there, we've experienced exactly who and what we are. Because we're created in the likeness and image of God, and if God is love, you're created in the likeness and image of love. You are love. You are love. And when we acknowledge that powerful experience within our life, this begins to rip off the veil, to take off the veil of clouded vision in our world. We understand that from within is this divine love. And it is around me, in me, through me, and always for me. 
Today's world, a lot of people say, I need to know who I am. I'm on this journey of self-discovery. I want to know who I am. Well, let me tell you this. The scripture has already defined it for you and made it so simple. Your searching has come to an end. You are love. That's who you are. You are first and foremost understanding that you embody that. You're created out of that. You're made of that. And that's your essence that you're there to share with the world around you. You then have this superpower that enables you to see with the experience and the power and presence of love into one another and see love there. That's right. You look beyond all the facades. You look beyond those uh, uh, barriers. You look beyond the actions even and you see the love within one another. The divine spark. The divine spark of love that's deep within that person. And then we begin to call it out. I see love in you. I see love in you. I name that love. No matter what you've done. Let me tell you this. As a pa father, as a parent, there's been many times when I've been with my kids and, well, they haven't been the perfect angels that I'd like to believe that they were uh, or that I would hope that they would be. And yet in those moments when they misbehave, when they've done the craziest things, there's still I see love and I see the love within them. I see it's deep within them. But that love overlooks or looks through all of their actions, all of their craziness, all of their misunderstanding, all of their struggles, all of their moments when they are uncertain about their own lives as they're growing and flourishing and trying to find themselves. In each one of those experiences, love sees love in someone else. So the unveiled life is one that's looking at a world that constantly sees the love within one another. There's a beautiful passages from Corinthians, uh, the chapter 13, 2 Corinthians. We call it the love chapter. I would like to read it at weddings because it tells people just how to love. Exactly good advice. The best advice that's there, it says, love is patient, love is kind. And I encourage couples to turn to one another and say, before you even begin the wedding experience, before you begin to walk down the aisle and share the vows, have you established the fact that you promise patience and kindness towards one another? Love is not boastful or rude. It's not arrogant. It's not all about self-serving and saying, it's me and it's my way or the highway. And if you don't bless me, if you don't take care of me, if you don't aren't there for my needs, what good are you? That's not love. Love is this wonderful exchange that says it's not boastful, it's not rude, it's not arrogant, it's not pompous, it doesn't have this attitude of being I am better or that one is first class and the other is second class in any kind of relationship dynamic. Now this chapter of loving is not only just for marital love, it's for love in all shapes and forms is how we move and breathe within this world, how we operate. We love this way. Every day we awaken to this wonderful thing that this love is not envious. I don't envy anyone. I'm not jealous of anyone. Why? Because love says, if something fantastic is happening for you, I know it can happen for me. So when you say, I got a new job, I say, ooh, maybe I'm going to get a new job. When someone says, I got a new car, well, maybe I'm going to get a new car. Well, maybe uh, I've, got, I've just fallen in love. Well, maybe I'm going to fall in love. Who knows what's going to happen? Because if it happens for one, it can happen for the other. And that's why love says, I am not envious. I'm not jealous. Because I look to see the highest and best for one. And if it happens for you, it can happen for me too. You see, that's what love embodies. So it's this wonderful thing that says, I, love bears all and endures all. This kind of love is an everlasting love. And how beautiful it is that when we experience this, we understand the depth of the unveiled life unveiled. There is no cloud. I now see and know that I love and love is who I am and this is how I love and I mature. Now the Apostle Paul wrote, writes in that beautiful passage as well writing about when I was a child I talked like a child. How many of you remember those experiences? When you were five you talked like a five-year-old. Anyone here at five talking like you were a 40-year-old? Uh, okay, we got a few. Okay, all right. So you were already advanced. But many of us really recall the childish things that we said and the silly ways that we talked and the things that we did as that child. The writer says, I, when I was a child, I talked like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, 
when I matured, when I awakened, when I began to experience the unveiled life, that's when I set aside childish ways. That text goes on to read from Corinthians, now I see but a dim reflection is in a mirror, that childish, dim, veiled reflection that you can't see through. Then shall we see face to face when we're awakened, when we've matured, when we come to this understanding, I am love and love is who I am and how I operate in this world, that every action, every deed, every step of my pathway, every way I move and operate in this world is love. I'm love. And love is that unveiled experience then that is mature that says, and then I shall know fully, even as I'm known. I'll know who I really am. I'll know as I'm known, as God knows me. I'll know as I'm known exactly the person I am meant to be. Wow. It's then I realize that I live and operate in this love in a perfected state. I operate in such a way that I am mature enough to see that deep within me is perfection. That's right. Now, along with us, we've been so influenced, so bombarded with conversations that say, you're not perfect. You're not perfect. And we embody that because we want to say, you're right, I'm not perfect, I make mistakes. So how can we be perfect? But it's the acknowledgement that you've been created in this divine essence of perfection. You're created in the likeness of God and that is perfection. And that is perfect. And that is whole. And that is complete. So it's time to own your perfection. It's time to own your completeness. It's time to own your wholeness and say, that is who I am. Yes, in the journey as it unfolds, there may be some challenges I have in unfolding it to its completeness, but I acknowledge it and I'm ready to go. I'm from here forth moving onward in a wonderful way that says, I am the perfection of God. I am the wholeness of God. And I claim it and I speak it and I change my whole attitude as I began to address it and move my thinking in that way. Because isn't it interesting that whatever we look upon or contemplate for any length of time is a transforming influence in us. The more you look at something, the more it transforms you. The more you become like it. The more you embrace it. The more it becomes you. So it's so important that we take into that scripture that says, that invites us, blessed is the man or woman who delights in the law of the Lord. And in this law doth he or she meditate both day and night. In other words, that I contemplate, I focus on, I look at the law, the spiritual laws and principles of God. When I look at these promises of God and I look at them constantly and I focus on them and I meditate on them and I understand that God's design for me is pure and perfect and goodness, when I embrace that, wow, it's transforming. Let me tell you this. This is one of the challenges we have in our world today. We just don't quite fully grasp, take in, and embrace the very beginning, the creation story. It says, you were made in the likeness and image of God. Oh, you mean, you mean this nose is God's? You mean this body is God's? We're not talking a physical likeness or image. We're talking about that perfect perfection and wholeness that you were created and God said, it's good. It's good. It's good. That's right. You're good. Created in that beauty. And then from there, we must live and operate from that place that we meditate, we focus on that. We get this very concept in our head. I understand who I am, what I am, what is my essence. It is the goodness. And I live from that perspective. That passage in Psalm says, if we do this, if we focus, if we contemplate this, we will be like a tree planted by the rivers of the water that bringeth forth its fruit in season. And our, and our leaf shall not wither, and whatsoever we do will prosper. Wow, how beautiful that is to think, whatever you do, you will prosper. So when we awaken to this truth, We've ripped off the veil. We look into a mirror clearly and say, I am love. And what I see back, ooh, I see love. When I see love, when I say I am love, I see love then reflected in the mirror of life coming right back to me. When we begin to say, I am grace, 
Grace comes right back to us. When we say, I am compassion, woo, look in the mirror. The mirror of life says compassion is all around you. When you say and begin to claim, I am forgiveness, forgiveness is seen in the mirror of life and reflected right back to you. When we acknowledge that which is within, it will then be seen without. How important it is that we love first and we move then into this wonderful ideal state in which all things begin to work together in harmony and beauty. And that's what unfolds for our lives. This life of prosperity that is promised to us. The unveiled life then is what we're called to live. When we do, the, do this, the mirror of life then reflects your highest and best and we see the glory of God all around us because it's seen in and through us. This text, though it may seem awkward in its word structure for us in contemporary language, we begin to now understand it's an unveiled face that looks into the mirror. It says, there is nothing, no facades of this crazy world that's been taught to me in ideas and language that says, you're nothing, you're not important, you're not special, you're not uh, worthy, you're not... Uh, seen as the child of God that you are. And when we rip that veil off, we see clearly into the beauty of the mirror reflecting back to us our life. There is a poet that writes, For life is the mirror of king and slave. Tis just what we are and do. So give the world the best you have, and the best will come back to you. Amen. It's our tradition to pass the mic around and have you share what is it you received today, what spoke to you. How are you uh, awakened today to the unveiled life? What is happening within your life or what will you take away? What will you ask, uh, what will you say to someone if they ask, what did you do, what did you receive in church today when you go home or at lunch or at the Taste of Faith this afternoon? Someone want to share? What spoke to you? Carla. Well, I just wrote that down so I remember it, but I like that you said when we, when we um, look in the mirror and say, I am, that is what will be reflected back to us. And I, I had thought of it like looking at it in the mirror and saying to myself, I am peace or I am abundance or I am love and having that reflected back to me. So I want to remember when I'm looking in the mirror, I can say that too, not just any other time. And that's very powerful, you know, because quite often when we say something aloud, we voice it it goes through, it comes in, we hear it. We not only voice it, but we hear it. So now when you stand in front of the mirror, you not only voice it and hear it, you see it. You see yourself saying those mouth, those lips forming those words, I am peace. I am love. It becomes a transforming experience and a great physical practice, spiritual practice. Stand in front of the mirror and be just that person. Yes, Carla, go ahead. I just wanted to add to that, that I, it just dawned on me that those are probably the most important words in the Bible almost, I am, because I am the Christ consciousness, right? So anything that I follow that with is, the, is, is I become. So those are probably the, most two, the two most important words I can remember from the Bible. Beautiful. That is the name of God. Is, uh -huh. How beautiful that is. The name of God, I am, that I am. And that in class, how beautifully it was brought out uh, by one of our students saying, I am that, comma, I am. And when we look at it, that I am that, I am what? Oh, I am love. I am grace. I am peace. I am these things. Say in front of the mirror this afternoon and every morning when you get up. And you will see this transforming power. Someone else want to share? What did you receive today? Or what speaks to you? Malcolm. Yeah, when we stand in front of the mirror, oh no, no, sorry. Oh, when we stand in front of our brother or our sister, and I see, I can see my, what I see in them is also in me. Right. However, if I make a judgment, then that, that makes me jump out of love. But to jump back into love, I just love them. Beautiful. And then in the same way, I'm loving myself. Very true. So. Beautiful. Thank you. That's great. Someone else want to share? 
John. I just love how the talk today was an exact match to the meditation and how I just followed my guidance this morning with that and it all came together and matched what you had to say perfectly. One of the things you said about your children being able to see past whatever bad behavior to love because it's your child um, is easier, more easily done than that with someone else, you know, perhaps it's not related to you. But that's a spiritual practice, being able to go to see within them love. And from the course I was looking at this morning, they said, love is true, anything else is untrue. I let go of anything that is not love because behind every story of separation lies the sinless truth of love. And that was about looking at your brother. Beautiful. You know, I had to learn to love myself years ago. And when I didn't love myself, I was one of the most judgmental, critical people you could ever encounter. In fact, I found great pleasure. My sister and I, we were preacher's kids, and when we went to a minister's conversation, we'd sit in the lobby of the convention center and watch people come in and go, look at that. Oh, my God, look at her hair. Look at her shoes. Oh, they have matching outfits. Oh, my Lord. You know, we were so critical. We were judgmental. We were constantly finding joy in tearing down someone else. Because we didn't love ourselves, We didn't really find that love within. So it was difficult to see love and beauty and grace. We saw the physical. We saw people's appearances. And we stopped there. We couldn't see deep in to the life and the heart and the soul and the essence of each and every one. Now, when I discovered the ability to love myself, my whole experience of life transformed. And I can remember, my mother would say to me, she'd say, you know, constantly, you know, you're so critical. And all of a sudden, you're not critical? What happened to my son? <laughs> uh, my mother used to say to me, you know, uh, do I look okay? How's my hair? What am I, my outfit? Because I would say, mother, you're not going out of the house looking like that. Mother, please don't wear that. Oh, mother, come on. You, this is, you, you can't do that. Go ahead and brush your hair. Do something, you know. I was so critical as a young man. And then when my mother would say, how do I look? And I'd say, Mom, you look beautiful. What, what happened to my son? Where did he go? Well, you see, I could never really acknowledge the beauty until I saw the beauty in myself first. How important that is that we spend that time because the love of God is there and that love of God is meant for us to be shared by loving ourselves. And then the unveiled life enables us to see others in the beautiful way that they are, that they are loved too.